Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Glad to be back with you again from here at the U.S. Naval Institute in Annapolis, Maryland, USA. A half century ago in August 1974, an unusual vessel was on an unusual and secretive project in the vast emptiness of the Pacific Ocean. She was the Hughes Glomar Explorer, built by the legendary tycoon Howard Hughes for the stated purpose of deep sea mineral extraction. She was engaged in extraction, all right, but not for minerals and not by Howard Hughes, but rather the Central Intelligence Agency. The goal of Project Azorian, as it was called, was to retrieve the wrecked remains of the Soviet ballistic missile submarine K-129, which had gone missing in 1968. Joining us today is the last surviving member of the Project Azorian team to tell the story of this as only he can. Retired Navy Reserve Captain Jack Newman was the only former submarine officer on the Project Azorian team. His background as a submariner, combined with his previous work as a submarine analyst for the Defense Intelligence Agency, made Captain Newman of a special value on board the Hughes Glomar Explorer, as you can well imagine. He was the first man to enter the raised wreckage and the last man to exit it at the end of the project. His theories as to what happened to the K-129 from a technical standpoint are extremely insightful. But his account in our current issue of Naval History Magazine, where it is the cover story, his account never loses sight of the human element underlying it all. And that was the fate of those doomed sailors who perished with the K-129. So I'm very pleased and honored to welcome to the podcast today, Captain Jack Newman. Jack, greetings, welcome. Well, greetings to you, Eric. It's been a long time coming to see your smiling face finally at the yeah. end of a phone. <laughs> yeah, Jack and I have become pretty good friends through this, but this is the first time I've ever talked face to face, virtually face to face. So, Jack, um, I'll let you um, go ahead and tell the story. Um, it will start with the the Soviet K, sub K-129 herself to begin with. And then you can sort of... Um, Explain to our viewers and listeners uh, your theories as to what happened. It's still a sort of a mysterious circumstance with various theories as to it, but you may be on to just the right thing. So um, let's start by talking about this sub herself and the unusual nature of whatever she was up to in 1968 when she disappeared. Well, it, it is uh, an enigma even today, it's it's a mystery surrounded by uh, clouds of fog and uh, misinformation, etc. The uh, K-129 was uh, the first converted Golf II submarine. She went in the shipyard in 64 and came out in 67. And upon the completion, she was now a real threat to the United States because she could now launch strategic missiles, ballistic missiles, submerged and didn't have to surface. She carried uh, three um, missiles, one megaton uh, estimated warheads each. Uh, she made one patrol in 1967 uh, from uh, October to uh, end of November, went back in the, in the, in the Petro or Petro Camp Hatchke, um, submarine base. And then given an open gangway, the, you know, the crew is, uh, was uh, told, well, you're done. You don't have to expect another long call for at least six months, if not 10 months. And, and then uh, a few things occurred in the meantime, which uh, made Moscow decide to send her back to sea to get underway on the 24th of February, 1968. And when that, when that issue, when that order came out, I mean, everybody was gone. All the officers were gone. The crew was gone. Uh, they had 14 days to get ready to go to sea when everybody got back. And in the, mean, in the meantime, the Russians said that, well, they wanted an Echo 2 from uh, Vostok to take her place. And then they changed that and said the Echo 2 and the uh, machinery breakdown. PKP Moscow, that's 
three letter designation for uh, their their uh, headshed in Moscow decided to send the K-129 out to get uh, into a position where they could cover shore to ship communications to verify if they could uh, some of the transmissions to the key lists, et cetera. For instance, the Russians uh, do not normally accept a walk-in which is what John Walker did at the embassy and said, he said, I got these keyless here, et cetera, et cetera. They're immediately going to think it's a, it's a, it's a trap. And so in many cases, in a case like this, especially when Walker represents the goose that's laying the golden egg, they want to verify his bona fides. And the best way to do that is to, is to take his keyless or whatever else he's given them and go down and capture uh, significant transmissions shore to ship and uh, see if they can verify his keyless. That's, that's, that's it in a nutshell, in a nutshell as far as what was going on at the time. She was, as I said earlier, in a situation where they had to put 10 pounds in a four pound bag she had to get the crew back in time. They only had 14 days to get ready. Uh, they went and loaded out their missiles, got underway and on the 24th, and then headed, headed to sea. The biggest problem that the, that the captain had and the wardroom had at that time was, was unifying a watch bill, getting a, a steady state watch bill that everybody would be happy with equal qualifications in each watch section. And that was compounded by the fact that the Russians had added 14 people to the crew. Uh, 10 of which, at least 10 of which, had special training, but no sea time. The special training was never defined. Uh, later on, uh, it was commented that while well, they were added to the K-129 crew for training. When you have a, a ballistic missile submarine go on alert, you don't add people for training, not, not 10 or not 14. It just gets in the way. You know, get out of the way, ship's crew coming through gets old very fast. It's a very small submarine for, for 98 people. And what happens is people, People tend to collect in the control room and they're watching things. They don't have any place better to go unless it's in the missile compartment. And that's an interesting aspect because uh, in, the, in 1991, when the Russian wall was coming down or the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, there were a couple articles that I obtained, one of which indicated that the captain Coast bar of the K-129 during the shipyard overhaul uh, used some um, large quantities of vodka to get the radio shack moved from the forward battery right next to his space to the missile compartment. Now that's a very interesting uh, piece of information if true. They had, uh, they certainly had room in the missile compartment to set up a new communication center. Also, because of their penchant for security, they have maximum control of access to the missile compartment, especially if they use the uh, lower level or middle level of the missile compartment for their communications. Anyway, that was a tidbit that came up, that came out in 1991. As she got underway, Mother Nature had uh, nicely blown the, the sea and shore ice away so she didn't have to have a small tug go out with her, which in, those, in, in March around uh, Petro is usually a problem, a big problem. Ice flows, big chunks of ice, etc. It's not a happy place for submarines when you got a lot of ice floating around. Anyway, they got underway. Went out to sea, submerged, surfaced, said, hey, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on my way. I made the dive. 
And at that point, somewhere around that point, the captain opened the sealed orders and away they went. Now, nobody knows what was in those sealed orders. I think the, the command staff in Petro Pavlas had access to it after the fact. They were told by Moscow, you can open the, the orders. I haven't heard anything over the years to indicate what was specifically contained in those secret orders. Uh, she headed south about 300 miles uh, east of the Emperor Seamount. If you look at the ocean chart, you can see the chain, underwater chain that comes up to about a thousand feet from the surface in spots. It's a great place to hide uh, a submarine from uh, Western uh, or e e U.S. SOSA arrays east of the Emperor Seamount. Low frequency tunnels are would be blocked. Um, so she headed south, uh, came to uh, 40 degrees north, uh, swung to the east, and then at a point around 8 March, she was supposed to send a message, a burst message, saying that I'm at this point, which was halfway, exactly halfway between start and finish, that is, halfway to the to the um, patrol area and uh, nothing was received uh, his uh, division commander in Petro contacted Moscow and said hey we need to prepare a sub loss plan and they said hang on uh, prepare it but we'll don't call us we'll call you and then uh, the k129 evidently proceeded to the, to the east along the 40th uh, latitude line. And at the, on about 10th, the 10th of, of um, uh, March, she crossed the international date line. And at that point, as is in our Navy, it's like going over a fence. Once you go over the fence, you're supposed to tell your boss, I'm now in their neighborhood. I'm now out of your your area of control. I'm in theirs. Nothing was sent. They they got nothing. So that's when they executed the sub miss sub loss um, operation. Um, now I was communicator and navigator in the Daniel Boone uh, second navigator commissioned it in Mare Island, and we were the first one to deploy in the Pacific. In 1965 and 1966, when I was navigator and communicator, we were experimenting with satellite communications. We had one satellite, one transit satellite, and we're trying to communicate with it as it when it came over, which wasn't regular. So we had to set it up, and as soon as she broke the horizon, we start transmitting, and we, we ran tests, which were which ended up being successful. Um, on the K-129, the communicator was noted for being an excellent user of the Globus system, which the Russians, the Globus covers a lot of SINs, satellites and whatever. But in those, in those days, it was, a, it was a, a mechanical device which would allow people to figure out where the satellite was. And when it came overhead, you could communicate with it. My point here is I don't doubt that the Russians weren't trying to communicate with satellites. So I think it's entirely possible, I'm not saying probable, it's entirely possible that they communicated on 8 March to Moscow. And that's why Moscow said, don't call us, we'll call you. And then on the 10th of March, there was no communications because she went down. That area, weather-wise, I've been through four or five times on a diesel electric submarine. And it's it's uh, it's really something to behold. We came out of the shipyard when I was a, a new Lieutenant JG and we had a brand new superstructure. And we're heading west to Yokosuka, Great Circle route. And we were maybe 45 degrees north. And the weather was just horrendous. We were making turns for 15 knots and we stayed in the same spot for a couple days. That's how bad the seas were. What happened was our brand new superstructure after the sail, about 85 feet, 
was carried away by the seas. That's how rough it was. So the K-129 could conceivably have been in the same boat, no pun intended. Yes, indeed, I did intend it. Uh, it's, uh, it's an area where you have uh, the cold fronts coming off the steppes, Arctic steppes, and they mix with uh, warm air from the south of the Philippines and then the, the counter-cyclonic weather from the west coast of the United States, and you end up with ty typhoon-type conditions. It, it's, it's just terrible. So my particular task over these 50 years, and I couldn't talk about it sooner than a few years ago because of restrictions that the agency had placed upon me. Otherwise, I would have. My task over these 50 years has been to put myself inside that submarine, which I have done almost daily in different situations to figure out what was it like? What would I do? What were they doing? How could they counteract different different things? Because believe me, when I stepped aboard the 40-foot remains that we recovered, um, I was a different person after that. I, every time I look at it or touch it, I would think about the guys inside. I would try to identify things I was looking at. And that wasn't very easy to do when you're looking at something that's been so terribly beat up. I don't mean to get off the route here. So I think what happened was she probably was uh, snorkeling along the 40th latitude, staying high, keeping the snorkel out of the water because the seas are so rough. And at some point, at some point around the 10th of March, the seas changed, situation changed aboard the submarine, wherein water was allowed to enter the snorkel system either through a head valve failure, uh, a piping failure, or and or, always, always include, you have to always include human error. Human error always comes into play because in some of these situations, you only have maybe at most 20 seconds to make the right decision. And if you don't do that in 20 seconds, it's, it's, it's ultimately going to be uh, the end. Now, the, the funny, not the funny thing, but the Russians took German submarine technology at face value. So the, the, the uh, power plant on the K-129 was exactly like the Foxtrot, which was exactly like many aspects of the Type 21 and the Type 7 German U-boat. The control rooms, uh, I think I could take a German submariner aboard uh, a K-129 boat, and he'd be able to go and point out the right manifolds for doing this and doing that, blowing, blowing ballast tanks, et cetera, et cetera. It was that similar. Um, along with that, the Germans, whoever's familiar with it, will, will remember that in the later stages of the war, they had the snorkel mounted in the deck, the snorkel pipe, and then they have to raise it up alongside the sail, and then it would connect with a line that went aft and then back into the engine room. So there'd be a valve, at least one valve between the connection and the engine room, maybe two. However, they had to drain once they made the connection with the pipe <coughs> to the ship ventilation or in, in, incoming ventilation. They, they had to drain that line before they opened the last valve. The K129, when I looked at the blueprints, and diagrams of it has the same setup. That is, they raise the snorkel mast to a certain point, and then it, it matches with the pipe that goes aft. And so they have to make the connection, they have to drain the line, they have to do exactly everything the same way the Germans did. We, fortunately, did everything different. We took a Type 21, uh, and tested it, beat it to death, and then ended up sinking it after we took everything we wanted out of it. And we came up with our own snorkel head valve. We came up with our own snorkel system. And I was fortunate enough as a 17-year-old to have orders to the USS Irix SS-482, which was the first snorkel submarine in the United States Navy. So at that point, they had, it was about three or four years before they had sunk the Type 21, 
and had developed our, our new snorkel system. So I, I got book and verse from all the senior chiefs when I was qualifying about what what we did versus what the Germans did. We did it the right way. To reduce the chances for human error, there's always a chance for human error, though. Uh, anyway, I think what um, possibly happened is uh, she's snorkeling shallow along the 40th parallel of the weather. The sea state gets really bad. And according to my weather uh, data for that day, predicted maximum wave height was 12 meters. And then when you go in and look at the definition for for the maximum, you can see that the, the maximum maximum could be easily double that to come up with a mean figure of 12 meters. So it was not a good situation. Now, one thing that a lot of people ignore, uh, they're not submariners, but when, when you look at the K-129, when I looked at it the first time when I was at DIA, the sail, 1,600 square feet. Now, that's the size of a, of a starter home in the United States, 1,600 square feet. So you have all this flat area of the sail. Water, as it turns out, is a, is a thousand times more dense than air. So if you have air at 10 knots hitting the side of the sail, it has a certain amount of impact and force to the sail. If you have water moving at 10 knots, it's a thousand times denser. So 10 knots now becomes 10,000. So the, the impact to the sail is horrendous. Now, like I said, on the Cayman, we lost 90 foot, 80 foot of our superstructure because the seas carried it away. Brand new, new bolts, new welding, everything. When we came into Yakuska, we were all embarrassed because all all the people on the beach could see was a sail and then a bunch of piping for about 80 feet. We looked just, just terrible, <laughs> just terrible. Anyway, so conceivably I can come up with all sorts of uh, scenarios, but one that I like is uh, when the seas get really bad, they have to the trough because the, 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 the swells, not waves now, we're talking swells, and the swell distance may be uh, four or 500 feet, 600 feet peak to peak. It may be 60 feet deep between the swells. So it's, 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 uh, it's the kind of sea state that grown men learn how to pray when they see it. And I've seen sailors on their knees praying on the bridge of the Cayman, saying, are we ever going to make it through this, Mr. Newman? <laughs> anyway. I can see them getting themselves into a into a serious problem where things start to break. Um, uh, another aspect of the design of, of the K129 is the after edge of the sail, just aft of missile tube number three, is uh, the most vulnerable portion of the ship as far as ventilation goes, because the snorkel exhaust comes up out of that portion. And when you see the, the and I have pictures of it, uh, when you see that portion of the sail removed, you see the pipes, you see the snorkel exhaust mass, you see where the snorkel uh, intake comes around from the starboard side and joins it. And then the line goes back down into the engine room and the snorkel, snorkel exhaust line comes back up. It's a very vulnerable spot. It's, it's where in our submarines, we would have the main induction. So I sort of nicknamed it the main induction area. Uh, that could carry away. That part of the sail could carry away. It could carry away the piping. The snorkel exhaust mast uh, well goes into the after battery, right into the after battery. And so at the bottom of that well, you probably got a drain valve so you can drain it before you raise it to use it. I mean, there's all sorts of possibilities here of how water would get into the submarine and into the after battery. It's, it's, it's just a, it's a nightmare to contemplate for me because once you get salt water in the battery, it's, it's, uh, it's horrendously, 
horrendously hard to describe. I read a, uh, it was a, not an article, it was a report from an army officer who was participating with the Russians in in uh, what happened to our to our people that you shot down over and during the Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. And the Russians would come back and say, what happened to our people in the K-129? And they were going tit for tat on that for, for a few years. And this army officer, after being exposed to, to the issues of a submarine that's dying, made a statement that, uh, that I've never forgotten, uh, to which he said, he doesn't believe that mankind has ever been able to come up with a more ingenious way for people to die, a more horrendous way for people to die than in a submarine. Now, the battery has 458 tons of cells. The Ford battery has the same. They're about two, two and a half volts each. They're two tons each. Um, when you get salt water, a mass of salt water in there, man, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, heavy duty welding time. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like you at home trying to change your car battery. And I think we've all done that at some point. And you end up getting the black touching the, the, the red at the wrong point or the red touching the ground actually at the wrong point. The red ends up touching a part of the engine when you're, you got the, the black connected to the battery. And all of a sudden you got sparking going. You're, you're now a junior welder. You've just qualified to be a junior welder. In a, in a, in a battery of 450, 54 tons, I mean, it's, it's 7,500 ampere hours that's going to a direct ground. It is gotta be the worst thing you'd ever see. So the submarine loses power. If the people back after are controlling the batteries and the motors, et cetera, are, they're gonna pull clear if they have the time to do that. Pull clear means they're gonna disconnect the battery. They, they have to. You want to take the load off the battery to keep it from cooking faster. Uh, I just can't portray to you in any more graphic ways than that. Lights are out in the boat. The boat's uh, going down by the stern. It's flooding aft. They all know they're going to they're going to buy the farm. They know they've bought the farm. The people aft are being crushed by sea pressure. Not only that, that they're being uh, fried. They're, they're touching. Everything's going to ground. They touch anything to water, they're, they're going to be electrocuted. I didn't put that in the article, but, but that's another aside to it. At some point, the battery after battery is getting so hot, it's producing plasma, hydrogen gas plasma. And at some point, that's going to explode. As it's getting to that point, everything's heating up. The pressure all is heating up. It's getting hot. The pressure all itself is getting hot. And uh, we noticed that when the, uh, was it one of the bonefish? The bonefish uh, was lost because she ended up with water in the battery and they had a battery fire. They lost four people that died from the toxic gas. When the XO was crawling out of the ship, when they made it to the surface, he noticed that the hull was hot to the touch. So mm -hmm. I use that mm -hmm. as my best example. Mm -hmm. At that point, the bending stress of a heavy aft versus the forward half, the control room, the missile compartment control room, forward battery, forward computer room, that's buoyant. And the after half is, is sinking. The forward half wants to come up and the two, it breaks, it ends up breaking in half. It tears. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the picture of, uh, of the boat. Let's see, I had one right here. I just not, well, I lost it. Anyway, when you look at the pictures of the boat on the bottom, the after half of the target object is clean. It's torn clean. And that's where it tore, it tore right by a, a welding joint that got heated up. It's, it's plain as the nose on your face. Arthur Conan Doyle, Dr. Watson, et cetera, said that the most obvious uh, fact is the one that's right in front of your face. Then that's the one that's missed by most people. And 
That's one of them right there. How could that be so clean? And at the same instant it broke in half, the after battery exploded. We end up with, uh, I don't know, can you see that? Oh, the, yes, the sonic. That's uh, the Ford. This, this is the after half for the acoustic signal. There were three precursors yeah. there, which I think were the battery cells exploding, and then the battery exploded. And then the rest is a flooding aft, a complete uh -huh. flooding aft. It, it, it goes on. The after half, I have to find that that piece. You think about uh, what, what you've seen over the years. Like you look at the Titanic. The Titanic ended up flooding forward, and the after half was buoyant. And at some point, when the the ship submerged far enough, the after half broke free from the forward half, and it sank slower. So the K129 is the inverse of that flooding aft and floating forward. The total time between start and finish, that is the the beginning of the precursor events to the last known signal of the of the forward half, acoustic signal, the total time of acoustic signals is, is nine minutes and one second. You do a really good job in the article of giving sort of almost a minute by minute, blow by blow of that. I have added more to the story I'm sure you recognize. Like yes. The most vulnerable yes. part of that K129 was right. the after yeah, part no. of the sale. That's all good. Um, so let's talk about this for a minute. So for years, the Soviets asserted that the what happened to the K129 was that the USS Swordfish actually collided with her, and that's what sank her. But that's absolutely hogwash, correct? Yes, yes. I mean, I know what the Swordfish was doing, but I'm not going to talk about it. But she Understood. was she was up where there was ice and and her periscope got bent by hitting ice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very very easy to do. Very easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, as I as I said in the article, uh, uh, if the swordfish were in trail of the K one twenty nine, the uh, the navy was in the process of developing. However slow the steps were, a procedure for tailing Soviet submarines, and uh, it became clearly evident right away that the best thing to do was uh, to lay back as far as you could and stay as far back to the point where you were just about ready to lose acoustic contact. You would stay right there at that edge and follow them that way. So you were staying as far away from the submarine you're trailing as possible. At no time is, is a nuclear submarine with reactor and, and reactor pumps going to speed up and get close to the uh, to, to the trail boat because the trail boat's going to hear the pumps. They're going to be con counter detected. That's just a fact of life. If, if the swordfish had struck the K-129, as uh, Admiral Dagawa said, the division commander, he said, he, when he looked at the wreck, he said, well, clearly the sail of the swordfish struck the K-129 just forward of the sail on the port side and crushed the hull. The force involved to do that is, is, is extremely large because the submarines are in a viscous state. They're in water, and you, you go to hit it, and you're going to move the object you hit as fast as you're going. So unless he's fixed in cement, you're not going to do much damage to him. To, to break the pressure hull would be, I don't know how you do that. I mean, I've been in a sub, I was in a submarine that was struck by a U.S. destroyer while we were snorkeling. His propeller, his starboard propeller, came across the top of our sail from port to starboard mm. going forward. And he, he knocked over about uh, 20 degrees and down about 200 feet uh, over a period of uh, maybe a minute and a half, uh, two minutes. And in that situation, for instance, I had just crawled in my bunk. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm uh, out in the passageway because the boat rolled over to starboard and it dumped me in the passageway. I didn't wow. know what was going on. Nobody knew it was. And it's the same thing with the K129. If she got hit by the by the swordfish 
and penetrated the pressure hull, they wouldn't know what was going on except salt water was up around their belly buttons in a, in a heartbeat, and they were sinking. I mean, it, 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 it just it just belies physics. Right. Here's well, you, I, in addition to the, um, the the technical blow by blow of um, what likely occurred with the K-129, you also um, s accused the Soviet government somewhat of, uh, I don't know how you would call it, uh, negligence in terms of the well-being of their submarine crew in this case. Um, perhaps you care to talk about that a little bit. They sent them out without enough time in port. They overloaded oh, them I wouldn't, uh, personnel. All these things were a recipe for the tragedy. They, they did everything they could. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, I know the crew was probably told, look, you got to get your fannies back here for Mother Russia. You need to do this for Mother Russia. That goes a long way with, with Russians. Mother Russia. Regardless of the government, when you say Mother Russia, the Russians have this affinity for the earth and they're going to end up fighting for it, regardless of what the Tsar says or Putin says. Ultimately, that's that punches the right nerve. Uh, the Russians, PKP, Moscow, Gorshkov, who was CNO, they don't care about the, the troops. I mean, not at all. You're going to do what you have to do. And if you have to put ten pounds of four pound bag, you better you better get to it. No, I, I don't think they have any, any regard for it any more than uh, than the Russians do currently in Ukraine when they're sending uh, untrained troops into the meat grinder of the Ukrainians to where they're losing more than a thousand troops a day, day after day after day. I mean, that's that's just throwing lives away. It's beyond criminal. It's inhumane. A lot was asked of the K-129. I think the captain and everybody did the best they could, but they ended up finding themselves in a maelstrom of uh, weather, technical difficulties, mechanical failures, and human errors, which doomed them. It's, yes, indeed. Absolutely now, doomed them. So the, we're talking about the article, The, the Loss and the Mysteries of the K-129, and the, uh, the cover story in the current August issue of Naval History. Jack, you did a wonderful job in this of giving us a blow, technical blow by blow uh, that um, quite likely solves the mystery of what transpired in the fate of the K-129. But hopefully in a future issue of the magazine, you can do an article describing some more about Project Azori in itself and um, your conclusions about that whole thing. Now that you're able to speak about it a little more since the classifications uh, are not like they once were. Uh, we'd look forward to seeing something like that from you as well, because I bet you have a lot of insights there, too. <laughs> Eric, you are one silver, silver tongue devil. <laughs> you are a silver tongue devil. <laughs> now, <laughs> how much time do I have? As much as you'd like. Huh? How much time as do much I have? I want like. to make a couple of you, you raised the subject of the mysteries of the K129. There are so many mysteries. I mean, really. I mean, I I can I'll, I'll lay one on the on the desk now for people to chew on, and uh, it's been commented that I never said anything about the nuclear weapons on board. I haven't. I haven't said anything about missile tube number one. Clearly, missile tube two and three exploded. Clearly, and I can even I can even see where the what the status of the submarine was, its position in space because of the way the sail was blown to port, port side forward. So she was down lying on her starboard side when the missiles, hypergolic fuels exploded. I've never said anything about missile tube number one. Why is that? Well, that's because I'm not sure there was a missile in missile tube number one. How does that grab you? Uh, that's a whole other can of worms. When I look grab. at it, absolutely. I don't have the answer. I can give my, I can come up with what if so's or this so and this is so this could be this could be I can do that yeah it's a, it's a, it's it's an enigma that's not going to be answered easily unless someone comes out from Russia and says hey the secret orders were and here are the changes that maybe they didn't load three missiles maybe they just loaded two and that they used the space and missile tube number one for other purposes to store other things. 
I don't know. I am not convinced that there was a, a missile in missile tube number one. And one of the reasons I have, there's two reasons I came to that conclusion after all these years. I've gone back and looked at Michael White has sent me pictures. I mean, it's what's uh, annoying is that the fish that the halibut towed to take the pictures, uh, the camera was at the after end of the fish. The floodlight exposing the subject was at the forward end. So there's a there's a spatial difference between what the camera sees that's illuminated. Okay, if you follow my thinking there. So yeah. I don't think yeah. we ever really saw with the light inside the tube. We saw the forward part and then the after part as the fish goes by. Uh, when I look at the when I look at the wreck, and I look at what's remaining of tube number one, it looks for, for all the world as a pressure vessel that has undergone collapse depth. One from squeezing the beer can and also water pressure coming in to the bottom of the tube. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. Now, hey, I'm going to 88 to say someone's going to chop my head off. I guess they better get to it on this one. But uh, <laughs> that's what I, th that's another, that's another mystery. Um, well, the, the questions um, still linger over this whole thing. Um, and uh, you were in a unique position to have some insights for it that uh, most of us um, are grateful to hear because you're on the inside of this whole project. And um, we definitely would look forward to hearing more from you about the project itself at some point. Um, because uh, this is just the sort of first layer of the onion, so to speak, of all um, the the known unknowns, if you will, surrounding this uh, the mysterious loss of the sub, and then the secrecy shrouded project to retrieve the wreckage of her. And you were right there in the front line of all that. And so it's a it's not only a privilege to talk with you and have you in the magazine; it's an honor. And um, I am grateful to you for that and for um, being in the magazine. And I hope we can have you in there again with some more of the story. Well, I don't deserve any honor. I mean, I did what, what my job was. I, I would like to comment at this point from the bottom of my heart about the crew of the Glomar Explorer. Those people were roughnecks from the Louisiana oil fields, the Bakerfield, Bakersfield, California oil fields. Some of them worked at the Nevada test site, drilling holes in the ground to det detonate nuclear devices that down deep. Some of them came from the oil fields in, in um, uh, Indonesia. I got to know them personally extremely well. I had to train them such that nobody got hurt. I had to train them to accept the fact that they may be having to deal with plutonium contamination. These guys ended up being probably the best crew I've ever served with. And that's saying a lot. I mean, I've served with four or five different submarines and great people. World War II submarines are the greatest people. They embrace me. I've, I've ever known. These guys work 12 on and 12 off for the duration. That's unbelievable. You can go maybe five, six days on a 12 hour shift and then you're, you're about exhausted. I don't know how these guys did it. Anyway, I wanted to make that point about the crew. Um, I, I would like to do a book about the about the ship and the mission. Some of the other mysteries, like I said, you're a silver tongued devil. I'll try to put something together for you on that. Um, I'd also like to do a story about the about the creation of the diesel boats wherever, because I was there when it happened. The sailor would be designed the pin worked for me. Oh yeah, I'd love to and see something on we, that. I would like to get that on, on paper. Well, we'll talk about um, that one too. Anyway, Eric, I really appreciate your support. Uh, again, I don't, I don't deserve any special credit other, other than I've lived long enough to do, do this. And I, like I said, I would have done this sooner because I wanted closure for the families. Believe me, I wanted closure for the families and myself. Uh, ultimately, the crew for the Glomar too. They never knew what happened, uh, they, I mean, they busted their buns. Uh, there was never any closure for them. But the families, I mean, I have a 
picture of the uh, of of the uh, skipper's wife and her son, who's now about six foot. In 1991, he was about six foot six. I have a picture of all of them. That's when the wall came down when the Soviet Union collapsed, and people started talking about these things. So that's at the point in time when this when the government of Russia recognized the fact that the families lost their husbands. That's when they recognized the fact that the submarine had sunk. That's when they got benefits from the government. Three decades, three decades later, what a bunch of crap. Yeah. You talk about That's people, real... them worrying about people, they don't worry about it. They don't worry about people. That's a profound injustice to those families for sure. Well, hopefully this gives some sense of closure and it's certainly a nice tribute to those um, doomed sailors. And um, we look forward to seeing more from you, Jack. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, and um, I wish you uh, the best. And I uh, look forward to talking with you about some future articles as well. Meanwhile, folks, if you haven't read it yet, make sure you read uh, The Loss and the Mysteries of the K-129 in the current issue of Naval History Magazine. It's groundbreaking stuff. Jack, thank you so much for joining us. I guess that's it for today um, from the Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. Until next time, fare thee well.